Panda acknowledges the traditional owners of the land where we work and live. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We celebrate the stories, culture and traditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders of all communities who also work and live on this land. Today's episode was produced on the lands of the Ghana, Larakia, Jagara, Yagara and Yugarapul peoples. Parenting is the big, long game. How do we support our women in our community that might be struggling, that might be vulnerable? Parenting is a really hard gig and some of our women need support, some of our men need support. So it's really that stuff of when I come home with this baby, how can I thrive as a mother? What are the resources that I have access to? And people want to feel that they're part of that because it's important to them. Professor Yvette Rowe knows that it's crucial for women to have choice and power making decisions around how they bring their baby into the world. And as a leading advocate for birthing on country, a practice that stretches back countless generations of First Nations parents, she knows that a good experience can set you up for your whole parenting life. So what is birthing on country? And how can it keep First Nations mums' physical and emotional well-being safe? I'm Gia, and this is Survive and Thrive, a podcast from Perinatal Anxiety and Depression Australia. You probably know them as Panda. Professor Rowe has a long history in maternal and Indigenous health, and she's a mum of two. So when the job came up to lead a new research centre at Charles Darwin University, focusing on birthing on country, she jumped at the opportunity. I'm Yvette Rowe. I'm a Nyingana Yaru woman from the West Kimberley. My father's family is from Rubibi or Broome and my mother's family is from Derby from a station just out of St Derby. I've got a family connection to Giramilla Darwin for the last 70 years. So born and raised in Darwin but very much identify as coming from the West Kimberley and really proud of those generational and ancestry roots. I'm the mother of two. I have a gorgeous granddaughter. There's 11 in my family. I'm a mad Richmond supporter. I'm an auntie. I'm a grandmother. I'm a sister. They're the things that make me me. The things I get paid for is I'm a professor of Indigenous health at the Molly Wadaguga Research Centre at Charles Darwin University. And one of our key programs of research is Birthing on Country, which we're very passionate and committed to and, and have a really long vision that um, through the research that we're doing and the evidence that we're generating, we believe it's one way of really changing the life trajectory for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies in the future. To start, would you be able to explain for us exactly what birthing on country is and what it means for First Nations parents? Birthing on country, people get caught up into things, oh goodness, which country are you talking about? And they really get stuck on that sort of terminology. And if we go to the, the facts is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land was never ceded. It's always been sovereign land. So whether we call it Darwin or Girramilla or Mianjin in Brisbane or um, Nam in Melbourne, everywhere you go is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereign land. So when we talk about birthing on country, that's recognising the sovereignty of the land that you're born on. So that's one of the key terms. But when we think about what is this birthing on country model or service thing, one of the, the things is to think about the best start to life where women feel safe, we get better outcomes for mum and bub. The primary thing is to feel like you've got choice in a system that's very institutionalised, it's very medicalised, that actually isn't woman and baby centred. One of the things is we have known for decades and decades, First Nation women feel unsafe in a medical system that pokes and prods them, that fails to engage them in a meaningful way. There's language differences, there's cultural differences, and they're expected to comply to a very institutionalised system which can lead to trauma and poor outcomes. So the woman can be very disempowered in the system. So that's one thing. The, the cultural concept, there's a clash there. And often we, we're we seeing across Australia and, and the world is pregnancy and birth is a very biomedical term. But we've been birthing for thousands and thousands of years and the concept of mother and child-centred care where the woman has voice and centre and, and has choice, is actually being eroded. 
Yeah, that's that's a very bold statement. But that's evidenced by the poor outcomes that we're seeing with mothers and babies. When we're seeing that babies are born too early, they're being too small, they're dying in the first uh, month of life, lots of babies are dying in the, the you know, within the first five years, but also we've got women dying. And these things really represent structural systemic barriers and inequity. So we have to really untangle that, dismantle the system that is hurting and harming our women and design a system that actually centres them, uplifts them, gives them power and place in that important part of pregnancy and birthing. Mm. Can you talk us through that time of pregnancy and birth for First Nations women? What are some of the things that they might come up against? It is. It's a, it's a critical time. And um, I'll use the example of women in the Northern Territory, remote women living in, in remote communities where they might not have birthing facilities or we have a unilateral government policies that says when you are 36 weeks, you need to come into a regional centre, whether that be Alice Springs, you know, Nullumboy or Gove and Darwin. So imagine being someone who doesn't speak English as their first language, doesn't have any relationship with the clinicians to the place that she's going, uh, might not have financial security, do not feel safe in the place that she's staying. Can you imagine the trauma that she is facing? If English isn't your first language, how can a clinician be sure that they have consent on a woman, whether they're doing an assessment, that, that whole stuff of when language is such a barrier, the system just fails to recognise the importance of consent and ensuring that the woman is across what is happening in her, in her life, in her body and what's happening with baby. And we're also considering the stuff of we have a system that is focused on risk and that risk often isn't explained to the woman in a cultural sense. What's the cultural risk? It's often determined in a biological or clinical risk. And that communication can be, quite, again, there's a breakdown in communication. So, again, the woman is not the centre of that care. We go along this sort of algorithm about what we expect from the system, and the system is failing to meet the needs of our women. So... I guess, how can birthing on country improve maternity services and health outcomes in remote and rural areas where care options are pretty limited? So there's a, there's a couple of things, is that how do we ensure we can get a system that will lead to a better outcome? And we've got some evidence. We did some research in the community in Mianj in Brisbane. What we found, that we could actually reduce preterm births by 38%. Wow. So that's amazing. So the model of care, which included um, a continuative care model with the midwife and the family support worker, they were able to stay together in very stressful situations. So it's protective. So when we look at the clinical evidence, which is you're going to have babies that are going full term and healthy, you've got a you know, you've got a system that saves money, and you've got a system that protects women. Avet, what are you hearing from First Nations parents who you work with? What are some of the key changes they would like to see to better support them in the system. So when I talked about the research of birthing in our community in Mianj in Brisbane, that's now 10 years old. So that the first little baby, that little boy is 10. And those women who have gone through that system have come back a number of times. So they're voting with their feet to say, this system works for me. I feel safe. I'm getting good care. The system's wrapping around me. I feel strong as a First Nations woman. That's what they're saying. The other things they're saying is, I want that in my community. I want to feel that I'm not just a patient ID 456. I'm Mrs. Jones that has all these issues and not to feel ashamed of that, that I'm working with people that care about me, that can help advocate, that can support me, that I don't have to change when I go into a system that can be quite traumatising. Women are really championing the, the change for other women. They're really excited that they're seeing a model of care that's voicing and describing their aspirations. They're also thinking, you know, birthing is one component of being a young woman. We're talking about sexual and reproductive health rights. There's a broader discussion that's happening. Um, the, the role of parenting. I'd like to think, you know, often pregnancy will go at least nine and a half months. It's very rare that we'll go past that. Birthing, you know, the, the, might go for 48 hours. But parenting is the big, long game. How do we support our women in our community that might be struggling, that might be vulnerable? Parenting is a really hard gig 
and some of our women need support, some of our men need support. So it's really that stuff of when I come home with this baby, how can I thrive as a mother? What are the resources that I have access to? And it, it, it's all that. So, yeah, sexual and reproductive ha- rights are, are, is a broader conversation and people want to feel um, that they're part of that because it's important to them. Mm, so the birthing on country model that you're researching in Brisbane sounds like it's working. Can you tell me a little bit about what that looks like? The issue is not just traditional practices like what happens during birthing. It's also traditional practices about what, what does it mean to parent and that intergenerational knowledge that gets handed down by the grandmother to the mother to the granddaughter, we've got to make sure that's really strengthened and, and communicated and also it's protected. Mainstream society don't see the complexity of a First Nation community because we choose not to see it, because it's not about respecting people's difference, it's about complying to a mainstream system. So the work that's happening at Galawinku is really privileging general governance to ensure that their traditional knowledges and ways of making decisions drive the model. The, the idea of that, it's intergenerational knowledge sharing, but also it's about accountability to the community. So it's not just about the practice, it's about how you do things as well. So general governance is the centre of that. Yeah, it sounds like a really holistic approach, doesn't it? And it seems like that's what's really needed to combat these systematic issues that First Nations parents are facing in the health system. We've touched on this a bit already, Yvette, but could you tell me a little bit more about what some of those barriers look like? I think regardless of whether you're very remote, remote, urban, you know, in in a, a well-to-do suburb in the city, There's issues about timely and appropriate access to a suite of maternity services. And what we know is the evidence is that if you have a relationship with your midwifery carer, you're going to get better outcomes. So having a relationship with a clinician, a midwife or a family support worker allows you to be protected and engage in a much broader system. So that's really so having access and timely access and culturally safe access to a clinician that knows your story. What are the things that people think, oh, it's only for the mob out bush and things like that, is actually transport. Transport to getting to a suite of appointments and, you know, the idea of whether you're coming from a remote community like Galawinku going into Nullumboy or to Darwin and sometimes if you've got a sick baby going to Adelaide or Melbourne, being away from family, being sent away, might not have, might have, not, might not have the financial resources. Is really important, but also in that journey, having people that understand your story. So transport's really. Um, the other stuff is when you've got so many stresses on your community, such as housing distress, financial distress, some people might be couch surfing, mental health issues, but you as a woman, you might have an existing chronic illness. So you never turn up with a clean slate. You always come with a complexity of issues, which adds to the richness and the opportunity for us to have a positive impact. So it's not sort of, well, if she, you know, if she just turned up, we all know that as women, we come to the table with a whole suite of issues and we're hoping that the health service can help us. But often it's that those, those, those extra burdens are outside the health service. And more often than not, clinicians are really limited in what they can do. So we really want the healthcare sector to be a strong advocate for broad issues like housing, financial distress, um, mental health, um, because we do. We we categorise things, well, this is the health service, this is the education system, this is housing, this is employment. But actually, we need to make sure we're designing systems that wrap around women and babies. Mm. And the work you're doing at the Molly Wadaguga Research Centre sounds like it's trying to do exactly that. Can you tell me a little bit about the significance of the woman who the centre is named after? Molly Wadaguga was a Barada elder from Manangrida who um, had been taken away from her community when she was very young and uh, was brought to Darwin to be at the Darwin Leprosarium when she was very young. And this this is in the you know the 1950s, so it seems like a lifetime away. This this young woman comes from a remote community. English is not her first language, but also she's multilingual in her community, and she starts to work with the doctors at the leprosarium. And she has this that she's she's considered a health worker, and she goes back to her community. So she's been exposed to 
you know, clinicians and how they talk about health, but also is bilingual and can translate that. So when she goes back to her community, she's quite a powerful and, and a powerful and profound educator, clinician, cultural um, negotiator, very wise woman. And she committed her life to two key things. One was that women birth in their community and they're supported by a system that supports it, but also people should be able to die in their community. So she committed her whole life to ensuring that the well-being of mothers and babies and the well-being of when people pass away is really respected. And so the we, we've, at Charles Darwin, we've named our research centre after her out of respect of her legacy. But the other thing is, across the country, there are lots of Molly Wadagoogas that have come before us, the grandmothers, the aunties, the sisters, the young women came, coming today who are really focused on and really determined to provide innovative ways to support our women in the community. So Molly's legacy is in all of us and we're really proud to, to name the centre after her. Yvette, how would you say Birthing on Country supports the emotional well-being of a woman during childbirth and in those important days, months, years after? If we talk about the integration, the holistic model of what birthing on country is, it's just not their physical needs, it's their emotional and spiritual needs. It's the idea that I can be spiritually safe in this place. Um, that's that's so important because you're working in many cases with a family support worker who be First Nation that will have a real understanding of where that woman's at and the trauma that they might be feeling or the you know the trauma that they've, they've brought into their pregnancy or how stressed their life is. You know, we know that the level of stress that women experience in life impacts baby. So having a model that wraps around it with a family support worker is really important. Having the woman feel empowered by a process is really important. But also there's some evidence that's being done by Professor Catherine Chamberlain at Melbourne University that talks about how a lot of our women experience trauma in the birthing setting. And she's coming up with ways about how do we have a workforce that actually can deal with that. So putting trauma as part of our model of care and addressing that is really important. Often when you're in a system where your voice is not heard, but the clinician's voice is is quite overpowering, allows the woman to sort of just become an object. So ensuring that their spiritual well-being, their cultural well-being is at centre to how birthing on country is, is really important because, as again, that impacts what happens when you, know, you, become, you start your parenting journey? That impacts how you engage with the health system later on. Because we do, we, we, you know, whether it's a checkup for baby or you have another baby, if you have been quite traumatised spiritually, what is the likelihood that you're going to see that as a friendly environment? If anything, it's going to be a traumatic environment. You might be more reluctant to engage with it. So when we talk about the woman, it's all those elements, the physical well-being, the cultural well-being, the spiritual well-being, and the model of care that has identified that it's you know, a known carer, such as a midwife and as a family support worker, as who acts as a clinician and an advocate, is really important because, again, as I was saying in the evidence in our study on birthing on country in Mianjin, Brisbane, is that we saw a reduction. We saw women more empowered. And we did do interviews with women after they had their babies. You know, some of the stuff was, I didn't realise how safe I was until I heard a different story. They feel so safe that they're, they're referring this, the, the model of care to their, you know, their sisters and their cousins and things like that. So they, they become the referral point. The idea that, you know, as the story gets out, women love things that can support their outcome. So we've got communities all over Australia saying we want this because we know that it works. So ensuring that pe- women feel physically, spiritually, but also the, the, the mental issue of having feeling safe that then carries on to the rest of life is really important because health and well-being is so much of who we are and how that impacts our parenting and our relationship with other people in our community. Yeah, and I guess part of feeling safe can involve having someone you trust by your side throughout your pregnancy and birth, which is where the Jackamere program comes in. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the Jackamere is a pregnancy and birthing companion. They're not the clinician that delivers. They're actually, uh, I talked about briefly before, about Gurutul as being in relationship with this woman in a strong way that supports them along the journey, that can be an advocate, 
um, that can might ask answer questions about how the pregnancy is going or delivery going. So they are your they're, they're your bestie in a culturally safe way. That also have ancestral cultural knowledge that can support the woman and reassure the woman. So. We hope to start running our second Jacomir training program by October this year and we're looking to graduate another 11 graduates. At the moment, there are 11 graduates uh, from the program and they're the only 11 in Australia who come from a remote community that are so proud to do this work. Um, so it's not just only having the Jacomir, it's actually coming up with innovative employment models and workforce that are customised to that community. So in a remote community where you might have a high turnover of midwives or the midwives being called into nursing duties because there's a short for all workforce shortage and they're not clinicians, they're community advocates, they're working with women. So so what happened with this Jackamere? She was able to go and support the woman during her sit-down time in Nullumboy, during the birth and delivery. She was able to there act not only as an interpreter but as a support person for the woman. Actually, the midwives and the doctors also used the Jacomir as an advocate. And as a result of that, the woman felt so empowered, so protected, that it was such an uplifting experience. So when you've got a, a woman that's saying, this Jacomir made me strong, I felt safe in that environment, and the clinicians are saying, wow, that woman needs to be part of our team, that's a win for everybody. So I understand that that Jacomir has four births now, um, which is really exciting. So we can be innovative it, you know, a, a model like a Jacomir is not in competition with midwives and doctors. It's a complementary set of skills that centre the woman's needs. Obviously, birthing on country is not a new concept. Would you say it's now gaining a little bit of momentum, um, a little bit more wider support in the community, or do you think we still have a, a way to go? I think people generally um, are scared uh, when they're told the stuff of you're at risk you're at risk of having a baby. If we don't do this, you and baby are at risk and things like that. My response to that is the system is so broken, we are at risk if we do nothing. And that, that's really important. The other stuff is having a healthy baby, whether you're again in Nam in Melbourne or Gallowinku or, or Tennant Creek, is actually a human right. It's not a luxury. So I think to myself, are we getting it out there? I think sometimes, you know, um, politicians, policy people, clinicians are really unsure of change. So there's different ways to have a conversations. In the clinical world, we need to put the evidence out there about how we manage to reduce preterm birth and integrated care and with a multidisciplinary team. We need to demonstrate to, to policy people how ineffective these policies are, that they result in health inequities. And we need to talk to politicians about if you are serious about closing the gap in First Nations um, health outcomes, it's a long game. It's not an election cycle. It's a long game, which means we can change this uh, outcome for mothers and babies, but that's going to be over three generations. And I think that the stuff of, again, the Molly Wadagooga Centre providing that rich, robust evidence is where we need to be making public policy decisions, funding decisions, and realise that the, this is a big investment to get big outcomes. You said earlier, you know, when you lose one baby, what is that baby's life worth financially? And if I said to you, actually, I could save that baby, but it's going to cost this, us as a community and as a country have got to say, yeah, that's a terrific investment. Yeah, Yvette, there is so much incredible change that women like yourself are driving in this space, and it's change that's long overdue. What makes you hopeful for the First Nations parents of tomorrow? I'm, I'm really um, energised about what's happening, the innovation that's coming. But I think, you know, as a, as a research centre, it is about getting the evidence that can stand up to being contested. I really appreciate the wider interest that as First Nations people, we have uh, limited access to mainstream society, which often has a big input on, on what gets funded and things like that. So, you know, your program's interest is really important. We need allies to understand not only the hearts and mind story, but also the evidence and to be a good advocate. The push from the women in community, whether it's Galawinku, you know, in Bartwa and Alice Springs, um, Catherine, Yurikala, you and country in Nowra, those women are pretty fierce. 
they are standing on the shoulders of their mothers and grandmothers and their sisters before them. They're not going to lie down easy. This is a fight that they have taken on because they believe in the benefits. So it's, it's going to be on the right side of history and I'm really excited about that. What a lovely note to end on, Yvette. But before we wrap up, I want to ask you one more important question. What would you say is the most joyful part of parenting? The gift that my children, my nieces, my family have given me, and more so in my little granny, my Mimi, who is six months old, has they've allowed me to become a much stronger, articulate, better woman every day. They have been my teachers. The, the knowledge that was handed down by my own mother, a strong, black, fierce woman, by my aunties. I'm connected to so much and it really is the power and the passion to know that I, I am a stepping stone for a young or not so young First Nation woman to stand on my shoulder and take my aspirations forward. That in years to come, you know, my Mimi, who is six months now, will turn around and think, actually, I don't have to negotiate a system that doesn't recognise me, that I can feel culturally safe, that I have got a voice in this system. That's the stuff that gives me joy. When, when I see my daughter, who is an amazing mum, navigate the ups and downs of parenting, when I see my nieces, when I see women take that space and sit, talk about what they want, that gives me joy. Uh, when, when I'm on the feet of old women, that talk about how they were born, their grandmothers, that gives me joy. I, I, I feel like that I'm a vessel that takes all this in and I've been so privileged to be one of those agitators for change because I was born of a strong black mother that said there's no such thing as saying no. You have a responsibility and you have an obligation to give back to the community and pay forward. So the job looks hard, but it's such a privilege and honour to... To, to make a difference and to be a platform for other people to springboard from. Survive and Thrive is a podcast from Panda, Perinatal Anxiety and Depression Australia, an accredited mental health service. You'll find all the links and information you need in the episode notes, wherever you're listening. But just a reminder, if you are a new or expecting parent, you can call Panda's free national helpline from Monday to Saturday on 1300 726 306. If you're experiencing a mental health crisis, call Lifeline on 13 11 14. If you're in a life-threatening emergency, call 000. The experts featured on this Survive and Thrive podcast are not Panda clinicians, but valued partners. Any opinions and advice is their own and not representing Panda. Panda recognises the individual and collective contributions of people with a lived or living experience of mental health issues, their families, loved ones and supporters. Every story informs how we care for people and their community. Survive and Thrive is produced by Deadset Studios for Panda, Perinatal Anxiety and Depression Australia. Don't forget there are lots more episodes in your podcast feed, so hit follow in your favourite podcast app. <laughs>